Hello, my name is Ajay Ryan. You're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Today it's an honor for us to welcome Lord Tarsim King. Lord King came to the UK in 1960, and in 1968 he became a comprehensive school teacher. He first entered politics in 1979, and 20 years later he became a member of the House of Lords. Lord King, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for inviting me here. Well, the topic today is practicing faith in politics. And uh, before we do get into that, can you please share with us a defining moment from your life? I think in my case it must be my application for the first job. When I came to this country, obviously I was graduate from Punjab University, India. So I actually applied the only job educated people could apply then was to go on the buses as a conductor. So I applied for that job and I was given an interview and some questions and afterwards I was told that uh, obviously I failed the test which I find very astonishing uh, because I was graduate in, in mathematics itself. So there were two ways open to me, either to give up or to work with determination and I chose the second route. So I decided that I'm not going to be uh, treated like that, so I have to fight that, and that gave me determination to go for further education, get teacher training, and then go into politics, and so that was actually change in uh, my life. Uh, if I had got that job, I might still be a conductor on a bus somewhere. Well, so you, from that experience, discovered a drive for, for life and to, to carry you obviously up to, to what you're doing today. That's right. Well, thank you for sharing that, Lord King. Can you please tell us, uh, especially for the sake of our international audience, what exactly does a Lord do? I think what we do, we got a number of bills come through the House of Commons and we go over those bills, which we call it uh, scrutinizing the bills. And we go line by line and a lot of people through their experience find ways to improve those bills uh, through amendments and uh, we debate those amendments uh, until we are satisfied that uh, that bill is uh, exactly on practical lines. And if we don't agree with that, uh, we reject that and uh, those amendments uh, and the bill go back to the House of Commons again to look at it again. So it is in fact scrutinizing the bill to make sure it actually stand out on practical grounds. And how, how does one actually become a Lord? Is it, uh, is it a nominated position? It is a nominated position. And uh, obviously they find people from different walks of life. And in my case it was uh, uh, through politics. Uh, because I was uh, the first leader of the council uh, politically from the Asian community in this country. Can you tell us a little bit about how that happened, the story behind how you first entered into politics? Uh, yes, I sort of, um, the area I used to live in, which I still live, uh, used to be a lot of Asians there, not 100%, about 5 or 6%. And I used to do a lot of uh, social work, uh, their day-to-day -day problems, because they couldn't speak uh, English. Uh, so a lot of people knew me. And uh, obviously politics was not uh, open to uh, Asians. The only party which can take you was the Labour Party. And you couldn't even join the Conservative Party. Uh, so somebody approached me and said that uh, there is a seat there which is uh, not winnable. We want a candidate for that seat. You are not going to win, so it is uh, better to, if you can, stand for us. I said, all right, if uh, there is no commitment afterwards, I will stand for that seat, which I did. And uh, I just won. <laughs> and uh, that was 28 years ago. And I'm still holding that seat. And uh, how, I mean, how, you obviously didn't just win. I mean, uh, you, you, you obviously must have campaigned. And, and how did you win over that, that constituency? Because as I said, there were five or six percent people who were uh, Asians and obviously I was adopted by the Labour Party so obviously they, they were doing the campaigning as well. Uh, so 
uh, my name came about and uh, the beauty was that uh, I was not really uh, of the opinion that I will win anyway and accidentally I did <laughs> and, and uh, that's how I start on the route in, in politics. Okay well let's then move on from that and, and look at today's topic practicing faith in politics. Now I understand you're from the Sikh faith. That's right. Now can you just tell us from your own understanding and experience what is the nature of God? I think to me God is something which you can't see but uh, you can feel that there must be something somewhere who is controlling all these things and uh, even if it is not there by the very fact you realize that it might be there keep you on a straight and narrow. Uh, but uh, as I said, I'm, I'm not practicing sick, but I believe in a service to the humanity because God is in everyone. And uh, do, do you find it's the case that politicians, uh, people like yourself, uh, in that position are religious in a kind of overt way or is it actually more common that politicians hold their faith or their religion back? I think politicians do tend to hold their religion back because politics is uh, really a number game and religious is uh, a actually belief and you can't uh, really say that uh, uh, you prove anything through belief it has to be through number game in politics but I still feel that if you believe in something that's going to be uh, your strength uh, and uh, that belief shouldn't be really in one religion or another it should be common religion which is common to uh, all all human beings because we are dealing with human beings and uh, it is important that uh, you deal with human side uh, from religious point of view not by just saying it but uh, applying its principles now our prime minister prime minister tony blair he's he describes himself as a practicing christian although i have seen him uh, on various uh, on shows where he finds it quite uncomfortable i think to talk about his faith well why is it that politicians find it difficult to talk about what they actually believe because when you say to someone i believe in that religion the ideal of any religion are quite high and uh, people always say if the politicians say something about religion side people always say right we find out where he go wrong then according to that religion and it is not that easy to actually comply uh, the demands of high demands of the religious side that's why they sort of sh shy away it is another way of saying I'm a hum human being and uh, obviously I can make mistakes but if they say I'm um, practicing religion, they say you're Christian, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. And I think press take it literally to, to that extent that it become very, very difficult to actually uh, meet those obligations. Lord King, do you think it's actually really possible to somehow divorce values and faith and beliefs from what we actually do, especially being a politician or being a position of leadership, is it possible to actually function uh, in what we do if we just want to put our values and our faiths on one side? Because I think your action, whether you are a politician or doing anything else, actually based on uh, your principles. So I, I can't see how you can uh, uh, divorce the two. Uh, because any decision you make, it depends on the situations and it also depends on the principles how you deal with that situation. So I think it is very, very difficult to divorce one from the other. But so, so why is it then that we, we hardly hear of what our politicians actually really believe? I mean, for example, on issues like gay rights or on issues of going to war in Iraq, we never hear from a politician a kind of internal perspective of why they think they should vote yes or no on issues like that? Because some issues are so complicated. You can see the reluctance of uh, people because uh, your principle come from your experience as well. So some issues are that complicated. It is not really easy. For example, look on capital punishment. It is, it is, it is not that easy to sort of say, right, uh, 
uh, I believe in that uh, because there are so many unknowns and it is the same with the, a lot of other things because the religious is a complicated business so it is very very difficult to distinguish one from the other so you have to be very very careful how far you say I'm doing that on the basis of religion all you can say is I'm doing that on the basis of my principles and my practical experience uh, so that, that, that's the reason I think people shy away from that so the, uh, having experience and and principles is more acceptable than having a faith or having faith-based values yeah because if you work as a politician on faith base you can't belong to every faith it has to be principles of that faith which are really common to serve the community rather than a particular set of religious people so based on that, can you please share with us uh, principles or values from your faith that are guiding the decisions that you're making every day? Yes, I think I always believe that uh, you only sort of ask which you, you deserve. Uh, because a lot, a lot of times, sometimes people ask things which uh, they don't feel they deserve. And I think that's the first principle I always say. Second is uh, hard work. And uh, the third principle is actually you do to other people as you expect them to do to you. The golden rule. And that's a golden rule. And uh, in, in, in the end of the day, your job as a politician is to serve the community in the best way possible. And uh, if you guide by simple principles uh, that uh, God is in everyone and uh, you serve those uh, human beings and uh, by serving human beings, you are serving God. Now, Lord King, what do you think about the potential of having religious leaders from all the various faith communities represented in our government in the same way we have a, a House of Lords where members like yourself are able to bring their experience in the everyday running of our country? How about having a house of religious figures where they can also bring their values and, and that internal value perspective in how our country is run collectively yeah I, I think on from history point of view I think we got uh, about 26 members who are uh, from the religious background uh, bishops or uh, reverend or uh, people like that well, in, in the house of in lords. the house of lords but uh, if, that's 26 out of how many lords uh, about 700 700 yeah. okay uh, but the problem is they are only from one religion. Christianity. Uh, Christianity. And uh, now we are a multicultural society. Uh, so that's why I think there is, um, we are talking about a reform of the House of Lords, which is a very hot topic these days. Can you tell uh, us more about that? Yeah, I, I think what the people are saying, you see, that if people are appointed to the House of Lords, then <coughs> they are not representing the community. Now, to me, it is a double-edged situation. Uh, sometimes, because if you look on House of Commons, they are uh, elected by the people. So they represent uh, uh, the community as a whole. But uh, then you got people with a lot of experience in their own particular field. So they are representing common sense and their experience and practical uh, knowledge they got through their experience. They represent that. So to me, it is not... Uh, against one another, really. Uh, so, so there is a debate going on whether they should be elected member of the House of Lord or appointed, or the combination of the two. But on personal basis, I don't believe a combination of the two will work. The reason being that uh, if you look on the name in the House of Lord, members are called peers. That means everyone is equal to each other. Uh, so if you are, some people are elected and others are not, then there are two classes there. And then people will say, I'm elected, so I have better power than you should exert. Uh, so I don't think that will work. So either it has to be, according to me, either fully appointed or fully elected. A combination of the two will make it very, very difficult to work on practical grounds. And 
with with the introduction, let's say, of elected leaders in in the House of Lords, do you see that there will be more religious figures included? And I mean, 26 out of 700 is a very small proportion. Because that's another problem. Obviously, if you got elected people, then it will depend on the people who elect them. Uh, so you can't really say we will elect so many people from the religious background, uh, because that will be people from the community, whether they are religious or not. So that will create another uh, difficulty, because you can't sort of say, we want to get s specific uh, area of your community into the House of Lord by electing them. Uh, in, in that case, somebody has to appoint them. Okay, so it's, it's obviously not as straightforward as it perhaps would need to be. But I guess the, the main concern is that people are making decisions, our leaders are making decisions which obviously affect all of us. And often it feels like they're doing that based on, uh, on judgments which are purely out of function rather than out of real conviction and out of real uh, connection with the hearts and minds of the people. And, and that's why I think the, the connection between faith and politics is, is so important. Otherwise, we're just relating to our society as, uh, as robots, because they need to function, they need to pay taxes. But what about their hearts? What about their souls? Because as I said earlier on, you can't really make a decision without your heart and soul into, into the situation. Whether people admit that or not, that's a different story. But any politician, he must have some sort of principles, and he must be using those principles to make those decisions. So we can't say, you see, a person is not specifically from Sikh community or Hindu community. They are not using principle of that religion into decision making. That will still be there. And, and what do you think about the current system of, of government? Are, are you, are you a, a believer in, in the way the government is now being run, the system as it is today? Because I think uh, if people start saying the present system is excellent, uh, to me that's a very dangerous thing to say, uh, because no system is excellent. People have to keep on working. But at the moment I think the democratic system is uh, the system, the worst of the all <laughs> uh, possible things uh, you can think of, then this is the better of, the, of all of those. So we have to find a way to make this system work. And that can only work if people have integrity and actually make decisions which are uh, really in the interest of people. And I think with the democratic system, obviously, if people don't like the decisions you make, not on religious ground, in general ground, then people can always get rid of you and find new people. Lord King, what do you think about the, the moral standing of our politicians today? I mean, often they're notorious for scandal. So uh, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think the first point is uh, politicians are part of the community. They come from the community. So what is happening in the community, they are the mirror image of that. That's the first point to make. And second point is obviously they are in a position of responsibility. And uh, they shouldn't either sort of say something and don't really follow it uh, because that is going to be suicidal for any politician to say one thing and do quite an opposite thing. And when that happens, uh, sooner or later, public will find out, public will sense that and uh, um, at election time they will treat you exactly uh, the way they have the experience of your performance. But often we, we hear the story, I mean, politicians who've uh, been found out committing adultery or uh, all kinds of uh, notorious things, they will make the, the case that this is my personal life and it has nothing to do with my public life. Does that make sense to you? Uh, not to complete uh, sense uh, from, from the point of view that uh, they should say one thing and do quite a different thing. Uh, now, I, I, I can see if their private life is different than their uh, public life. Uh, but what do they preach other people? They should at least uh, practice that as well. And it is no good saying to other people, you should do this, you should do that, and you don't do it yourself. 
Now you can make a mistake, but then you should be big enough to say, I made a mistake and uh, that is nobody else's fault but mine. And I, I think that, that, that should be the point. Well, Lord King, following on from what you said, often it's the case that when it comes to our leaders, we will do not as they say, but as they do. So based on, on that uh, assumption, uh, what do you think can give the moral backbone and, as you said earlier as well, the integrity to our political leaders? Yeah, I think integrity is very important in politics. But having said that, I think the uh, situation politician has to go through is quite difficult as well. Because if you look on the public, sometimes public demand things which they know politician can't deliver. But they still expect their politician to deliver. Can you give us an example? Uh, for example, if you put up taxes, for example, people will say, no, no, we shouldn't be paying that much tax. But they want more and more services. Expectations are quite high, uh, high and rightly so. Uh, but having, uh, when, when you put those sort of expectations in front of the politicians, uh, then I personally feel that people should have enough integrity to say that can't be delivered. Uh, but the system is such that politicians tend to say, yeah, we will try our best. They don't even say that. They simply say, we will do it. And then the trouble starts when they can't. So I think there should be integrity on both sides. Uh, expectation should be reasonable so that politicians are in a position to deliver uh, to that expectation without being uh, a bit deceitful here and there, which uh, you can't condone really. If, uh, if, if it comes to the crunch, then they should really say, that is the bottom line, that's uh, all we can do, and we will try our best to do that. Well, having been now in politics for more than 28 years and uh, having been a, a Lord, a member of the House of Lords uh, now for almost a decade, what do you think is the moral compass of our politicians today? I, I think uh, sometimes uh, the politicians are uh, not as good according to the people now. And sometimes media make it worse. Because if you look on media, media does the same thing in a lot of times. Uh, they, they are not really sticking to uh, principles either. Uh, sometimes they will sort of create stories by uh, different means, which are not really uh, according to the principles. So I think people should lay their cards on the table and say, from every angle, the public, the media, the politicians, and uh, try to do best for, uh, for the people. Now, as far as I was concerned, as I said earlier on, I was not really a politician. I, I came into politics uh, uh, coincidentally. Uh, so, uh, to me, the aim is to serve the community as best I could. Uh, and in, when I said I could, that doesn't mean you do little or do, do nothing at all. So you have to still make sure you see the aim you go on in politics for, uh, try to uh, strive to achieve those aims. I think that's very important. But do you think, like in the House of Lords or in the Houses of Parliament, for example, should the Prime Minister be that moral compass for our leaders, for our political leaders, or is it possible just for our Prime Minister, can you imagine, just to do whatever he wants and to be completely out of tune with the morals of society, but nevertheless to do a good job as a Prime Minister? Yes, I think you can, uh, provided you got principles which uh, accord with the public. Sometimes if you simply say, you see, I will go to war here and there uh, without uh, looking on the consequences. Now, I, I admit you can make a, a wrong decision, uh, but then you should be able to say, right, in the, uh, with hindsight, I do admit there was, that was a wrong decision. Uh, but in politics, you can't afford to be wrong all the time. But I mean, in the case of war, Tony Blair, I, I think even as George Bush himself said, God told me to go to, to war, to go against uh, Saddam Hussein. And I think to some extent, our Prime Minister Tony Blair, he also had this divine, I guess, uh, quest, or uh, certainly he, he felt that there was a higher cause behind just the political or the the financial gains of going to war. Now, 
and, and that's my point, is because can we just allow our leaders, especially our key leaders, to guide the country, and not just in the case of war, but I mean in terms of like, in terms of like, let's say family breakdown, can we really have leaders who are themselves falling apart when it comes to their families and yet allow them to run our country? Yeah, I think that, that that's, uh, with that sort of a situation, people lose credibility and they can't stay politician for too long. But th that's the point. Can yeah. they still do their job? I don't personally think they can. Uh, they have to have basic principles. And uh, if they can't even follow those principles themselves, which is in their power to do, uh, I, I do say they can make mistakes. But then they shouldn't really say, what I say is always right, because that can't be the case. Now, Lord King, there's no doubt that being a leader of any kind in society today is, is a great responsibility, and it also comes with a great burden, especially a political leader. As you said earlier, there's a lot of spotlight from the media. And particularly we see when there's an election race or within parties, there's an election for the leadership of the party. Often the spotlight will be on the moral aspects of those candidates and how they actually live their lives rather than their policies. And if they fail the moral test, they tend to then go on to lose or even be thrown out of the party. So how can we support our leaders in those positions so that they can not only fulfill their function as politicians, but maintain their standards as leaders of our society? What I think, can we do? I think that will depend mostly on politicians, uh, because if politician doesn't uh, stand up to scrutiny of the public, uh, then he can't stay a leader too long. Uh, so it is self-regulating situation, really, uh, in that uh, if you want to say something, you say it with convention, and you can't really sort of say anything and do quite different things. Well, coming back to you, Lord King, and in, in your constituency, which is West Bromwich? Uh, in the yes, Midlands? Yes, West Bromwich. Now, how, how are you bringing your faith and, and your values and putting that into practice with what you're doing back in, in your constituency? Yes, I think if you look on my constituency uh, as a whole, I, it is a multicultural area. Uh, we got people from all religions. And uh, if you look on most of the religion, basic things are normally the same. Uh, and sometimes you create uh, uh, extreme people. Now, they don't believe in religion. They are really a creating problem for the community. Uh, to me, if I'm invited to a Sikh temple, I go there. If I'm invited to a church, I go there. And the aim is for me to listen to people, their concerns, whether they're moral concerns or uh, their financial concerns. I listen to those and try to match them with my principles uh, w when you make decision about uh, other people's life. But so, for example, if, if you're faced with an issue that is at odds with your principles or your values or your faith, how do you then go about making a decision? Because no decision is totally against uh, 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 either religion or, or, or belief. Because politics is a compromise. If you can achieve 5%, rather than 100%, it is much better to go for 5%. Now, that is not compromising your principles. Uh, you are doing under the circumstances, because uh, politics is the art of uh, an impossible situation sometimes. And you have to weigh up one against the other, and uh, you have to make a decision so that you can achieve as much as you possibly can under the circumstances to, to the people you represent. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time, Lord King. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, and uh, we look forward to welcoming you back again in the future. Okay, thank, thank you. You've been watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. If you'd like to find out more, we're on the web at www.definingmoment.eu. Thank you for watching, and we wish you all the best.